So I'm happy to take questions if you have any or, or not. Yeah, you know, these debates come up at the UN every now and again, but they don't come up that often because the people who raise these kinds of claims are very embarrassed by it. There is no developing nation on the planet who will sit by and allow this claim to be made because they immediately take the floor to say, the Catholic Church provides the largest or the only health network in my country. The Catholic Church is the largest provider of health care in the world. And this is above and beyond anything that governments are able to do. So at the level of care, the Catholic Church is the one there. Even we can say in New York City, the first response to the AIDS crisis which erupted in the gay community was the Catholic Hospital of St. Vincent's. They were the only ones that received these people. People didn't know how the virus was transmitted. They didn't know what was going on. But St. Vincent's was in the village. This was the epicenter of the, of the pandemic. And every single person went to St. Vincent's and every single person was treated. So around the world, the reality is that the Catholic Church is the greatest provider of health care to everyone, whether they're Catholic or not, whether they are you know, experiencing difficulties or not, whether their actions are in compliance with what the church teaches or not. So that's the first thing that's very important to say. The second thing is that the data driving this assumption just isn't there. There's no data to support these claims. So when you look at HIV and AIDS, for instance, you can look at a lot of programs that have been established to, to take a look at how we're going to fight this. There are, there are two main generalizations that are looked at now. One is, one was made popular by the Ugandan proposal called ABC, so abstinence, behavior change, and condom use. The other is called CNN, condoms, needles, and negotiation. So these are the sort of general frameworks of the debate. The data is very clear. The only programs that reduce the spread of infection, so the rates of transmission, are abstinence and, and faithfulness campaigns, or the use of condoms if a person is not able to get out of what's already a highly compromised situation. But condom use alone is not showing in any data or evidence to either drive down or change rates of transmission. So for instance, a, a big study in Taiwan is cited to say there was a condom campaign in Taiwan all of the brothels insisted that men who were flying into Taiwan or to have sex with other men or with women had to use condoms so that they would cut down the rates of transmission. The rates of transmission went down among sex workers in Taiwan. But when you take a look at the data about why that happened, it was not condom use. What happened was people got scared, they understood the gravity of the disease, and the rates of transmission went down because people got out of the sex trade or because people just stopped participating in certain activities. So this is very important to see that we have this idea. Now, what we do know is that condoms can contain the spread of infection of HIV and AIDS within the homosexual community if they're used consistently and well. What we also know is in the United States, in Russia, in many places across Europe, the incidence of disease is ri rising again because nobody likes to use them. Nobody does use them consistently and well. And with the rise of better medical care and, and all of the different you know, ARVs and possibilities for treatment, people are not using them. So the rates of transmission are back up. So the reality is that these are very loaded political statements but the data doesn't back them up at all. There just is not data that shows that condom use prevents or reduces any of these things that it's claimed to prevent or reduce. And we see the same thing when we take a look at heterosexual activity. 
Because the reason is this. If someone is engaging in multiple partner activities, whether they're homosexual or heterosexual, their rates of incidence of disease contraction are high. And condoms can maybe help to manage that, but you still have an upward trend. If someone is in a committed relationship, they don't use them. Maybe for the first three weeks or three months, but there's just a total drop off in 12 month use. So all of this stuff is very important to go into. And you can certainly have a very clear debate. The evidence is there. We have evidence like this on all of these topics. We have our HIV AIDS white papers. We have women's uh, health. We have maternal health. We have all these population debates. If you know the data, you can defend all of these positions. But these are sort of floating comments in the culture that people have just adopted uncritically. And it's very important that you know the data so that you don't get into a heated exchange, but you can just say, well, here's what we know. And luckily, we're 20, 30, 40 years into this, and now we can actually look at the research. There's a lot of research out there, and all of the research is very clear. That's This is a difficult question because when you look at the peer-reviewed data, you have conflicting answers in it. It seems very clear if you look at certain data and if you disaggregate it very clearly that the use of artificial contraception increases rates of sexual activity and rates of promiscuity. But it's something very hard to show in the accepted data. There's initial data that's also starting to show that the use of contraception, for instance, for health purposes, so let's say a 16-year-old girl is put on the pill for, for difficulties that she has with her cycle and her hormones, leads then to behavioral outcomes. So this data is there, but it's not, it's not, well, it's not well accepted. So you can certainly find it. I think it's very well done. But there's definitely debate within the community on that point. Our clinic in Ohio, I showed briefly, we just have opened this clinic. It's new. We have 230 patients right now. So it's a very small amount. It's the very beginning. Most of them are faculty and students from Ohio State University. Most of them are sexually active and on contraception. They're coming to us because of the symptoms that they have, what we call the signs of hormonal abnormalities. We advertise to say, do you have acne? Do you have mood swings? Do you have weight gain? Do you have pain? Do you have depression? It may not be your fault. It might be your hormones. Come in and let's check it out. When we start to take the blood draws and show them how their hormonal levels are looking, right now, among these 230 individuals, every single one of them has stayed with us and every single one of them has decided to get off of their contraception so that they can correct the underlying health imbalances. What we can say for sure is that in this small data sample, because of that choice that they've made, there are different behavioral choices that line up behind that. I think the important thing that we need to show, and now that we have medical protocols that can care for all of the reasons a woman might be put on the pill in a better and more effective way, I think the essential thing is really to enable us to say, if we can treat your health better without contraception, contraception becomes not a medical question, but it becomes a question of a lifestyle choice. And giving someone the opportunity to even think about that is a gift because it helps them to think about what they want to do with their lives, what decisions they want to make, without just sliding into relationships or sliding into activities because something else is already there. So that's what we, what we can say definitively is our experience of approaching that this way. But what it has shown us is two things, is that number one, people want to take care of their health and they're happy to make decisions that will help them do that. And the second thing we've seen is that we have, not, we have yet to meet a man who has wanted anything other than best in healthcare for the woman that he's been with. So I think that's also very important for us to showcase, to say all of the boyfriends and the husbands of the women that we've worked with have been very excited 
to do whatever they have to do to help help the woman they love have healthier outcomes. Yeah. Um, are there any particular countries, states, or regions in the, in the world that are supportive of the work as opposed to other uh, countries, states, or regions? Well, within the World Youth Alliance, we've been at the UN for 16 years and at the at the EU for 14 years. We work very closely with many countries and with their representatives. So in that context, we have continuous relationships with different people as countries, as, as, as governments change, they're very different. One thing I can say is that we've had very close and friendly relations with the Malta delegation to the UN for many years now. So it's always a pleasure to come to a country where we're working closely at other levels as well. Uh, what we can see is that working with an entire country, there are limited countries that we can work with, but there are many courageous people and many people of goodwill who work for their nations who may not have similar ideas on everything that we support, but where they can align with us, where they can support us, they want to do that. What we can also see is that the approach of the World Youth Alliance, which is that we spend a lot of time preparing our members they have to do a lot of study to go in. They work in a very good way. They understand the rules and procedures of the UN and the EU. And this has meant that we've had a large welcome even from people who don't agree with us. And we know that countries that don't agree with us always want to work with us to have the alternate voice in the room than with any of the other groups that are there. So I think that's also important, that we want to be able to represent the ideas we love in the best possible way and we want to make sure that other people feel that they can engage with them because they see that there's a reasonable or kind or appropriate way in which we can do that. As we're moving now to FEM and the Human Dignity Curriculum, these programs are very new. And what we are starting to see is quite um, a good response, but in small areas. So we've worked with the government of St. Lucia and they're eager to continue. There are other governments in the Caribbean that looked at this. We've been in contact with some governments in Latin America, increasingly in uh, Africa. So these are beginning conversations because we have not been ready either with a full model. And what we're doing now is really the first step towards even being able to move forward with those conversations, which is starting to approach medical professionals and educators because if we don't have people trained and able to, de to, to deliver these services, it's hard for a government to adopt them. But for us, it's been a wonderful experience presenting these programs, particularly FEM. Many people have been very excited, and there's been a strong response from the medical community. Yeah. Well, the overpopulation arguments are decreasing because the reality is that every country in the world has a decreasing population number. So some of the highest population numbers now left are, are 3.6, 3.8. They're not very high. These are in some African countries. So it's, it's increasingly difficult to make the case what they do discuss now, and this is what we're debating at the moment at the UN, is this idea of a demographic dividend, which is that if you cut the birth rate and then you have a large population, let's say of five to 18 year olds, you get this demographic dividend for a small amount of time. They don't say for a small amount of time, they just talk about the dividend, which is now you have more resources in families and in a nation as a whole to pour into this one generation and out of that, you do get a little bump because they, they build in, they, you know, they have an educational investment. You have all these investments, which are the actual drivers of economic and cultural development. But then what we're seeing in many countries is then you have the demographic slump and that follows and nobody is really addressing this. Um, so what we're seeing is the language is really this demographic dividend language. 
We do a lot of work on this. We have a lot of white papers. Uh, this week we're releasing an infographic on population and sustainable development. There's a huge negotiation that's finishing this year on the sustainable development goals. We've been a part of that for the last three years as it's moved along. So we're constantly making these arguments. And I, I refer you to our white paper. It has a lot of great data. It shows the economic, the population, the cultural drivers, where we are, um, and the importance not of limiting population or of putting more power into the hands of corrupt states, but of actually correcting the underlying problem, which is corruption, and challenging the people who are not building roads for their people, not getting clear water, not building schools, and the idea that we should give them the power to decide what the poor people should do, even with their families, after they've you know, pushed them down in all these other areas, doesn't make any sense. So we're trying to reframe the debate and all of the data, and most of the economists um, are on our side on this. So again, once you look at the data, the whole thing is very different, and you can really showcase the political moves that are inherent in all of this. Yeah. Okay, yeah. Well, I mean, it's, I think it's, it's, it's no secret that the number of countries that are embracing and promoting the types of ideas that I'm presenting here are not so large in number. I also was thinking as I flew into Malta last night and I could feel the, the sort of sea air and see the palm trees, I thought, all of the countries that we really do some deep collaboration with are islands. So, <laughs> so there's, a, there's a correlation between small countries that are looking independently at different trends around them and are keeping certain commitments alive. And I think that that's something very interesting. And um, it's not the first time that small countries have been sort of the keepers of, of great ideas necessary to the survival of civilization. We work with a, a number of countries in Latin America, many in the Caribbean, uh, some small countries in Europe, here and there. You could imagine who they might be. Um, a large number of countries in the Middle East and African countries. The Philippines is a country in deep transition right now, um, and we have been working very, very closely with many of the debates that are happening on the ground there, which are not being driven by, by their local people, but are being driven by aggressive international interests of the United States and other major NGOs at the UN. So increasingly, we participate in national fights that are sort of imposed by international agencies. We think it's very important that countries have at least some support, at least an understanding this is not a national fight, and here's what this language and this strategy actually means. That said, you know, as I mentioned, we work with individuals in some countries where the country position is not with us, but the, there are many good individuals, so we do try to do that. Something that I just want to mention in passing is that 
I think it's important, and we talk a lot to our members about this, that while we make common cause with many countries to accomplish certain things at the UN, um, the UN is a place that really illustrates that politics makes strange bedfellows. Um, and so, on the one hand, we have, as I see it, these sort of peripheral issues where we can agree here and there and try to pull together votes and support. But when you go to the center, I think that's where we really still share a lot in common with Western states that may not agree with us on the specifics, but still have a much deeper and better commitment to the dignity of the person. That's my view, and that's what fuels our continued attempt to collaborate with some of these other countries over time, which is not possible with some of the allies that we're making certain amendments or other things with. I think that's more or less the political spectrum <laughs> that we're dealing with, but um, you know, we have, we have members in 167 countries. Obviously, some of those are active, some of them are not. It demonstrates the universality of these ideas. And what we're starting to see is that for us, we now have a very broad network that's very stable and it can be activated and very effective quite quickly. And what we now have, in a way, both the responsibility and the privilege of doing is deepening that network in certain areas. And so we're very interested to now find places where we can invest deeply in our members or develop small local pilots so that we can start to figure out how do we actually pull this whole thing together, um, this whole policy wheel that we went through, and then make these little beachheads from which we can expand into larger areas. Does that answer Thank you very much. all three of your? OK, good. <laughs> yeah? Yeah, right now we're trying to keep it somewhat contained because we're moving into the next step of evaluation. So in the United States, we are now working to establish nine schools that we'll be in in the fall. Um, so the next phase of evaluation for us is really working with teachers and principals, figuring out how to integrate this into the curriculum that they're already offering, um, and figuring out the training and support that teachers need so that they can deliver this in an ongoing way in their school. That's really our plan for this coming year in terms of the most important focus strategy we'll have. From there, we'll be able to then really ramp this out. And we're starting to have interest from individual schools, school districts to move that. Once we complete this process, we will then be ready as well to translate the curriculum. And, and that is necessary, obviously, to move it into other countries around the world. So in the meantime, in this coming year, we have many of our members have a great interest in the program. And so what we're beginning to do is train them in the program so that they understand the ideas, they understand how it's delivered, and they can then help us to ensure and figure out the best way to implement it in their countries. But what we can see as a process is really training people from the community or area that it will go in. They have to manage both the translation and the cultural modifications, which might be just simple things like different pictures or different examples, but making it relevant and clear. Um, and then figuring out the best place to start a pilot. So every new country or language we go into, we first want a pilot. It can be a small or medium-sized pilot. And from there, we can then look at a larger rollout if there's interest. That's more or less the process. It really depends how education is managed in various countries. In the United States, for instance, government has, has very little direct control over the curriculum. And it also depends if it's a public or a private or a Catholic school. What's most important in the United States is, is two things. The principal gets to decide what's taught, and it has to follow very bare bones, national you know, credentials. This program is set up to meet those basic criteria, so we can demonstrate how it does that. So it's really about finding principles. So in the US, we're not getting opposition. In Mexico, we've been piloting in a school for street children. It's gone very well, and now 
the people involved in this project are tied into the government, so they're starting to be very interested in it. We were approached by another government in Latin America that's examining the curriculum. So there are some places where the government is very interested. There are some places where the government will be totally opposed and some places where it doesn't matter. So I guess the big answer is we can do a lot with governments that are not even intersecting with this low level of decision. And then I think there's a lot we can do here as well. Yeah. Yeah. The problem, the country is very aggressive. Yeah. Now in Malta, where so-called sexual health education is involved, we were told by government officials that no school has the right to refuse the recipe which is being going to be rammed down the throats by the, the government of the day. Now, on the other hand, the church, and in more than one year, 50% of church schools are run by, by, by religious orders, technically. And um, in the Charter of Human Rights, of Family Rights, it, it states that the education of children, especially on sexuality, is the responsibility of the parents, not the state. And the educational establishment has to respect the ideas or the desires of the, of the families and not project a program which is ideologically driven or whatever. Do you enter any sort of conflicts or or you try to keep it open? Uh, no, I mean obviously if we're going to how many faith based schools in 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 Britain and in the States, how is it that all these schools are they aware of what is at stake and why don't they adopt a philosophy which should be basically positive and in the interest of what we believe? I, I think the shortest answer is that the reality that we can see all over the world is that doing nothing is not an option. So we have to do something. And that's really why we've created this program. We think it should be consonant with any of the commitments that these religious or faith-based schools have. We're happy to work with them to make modifications. Um, parental involvement can be as high or as low as you want. I mean, there's a direct correlation between student outcomes and parental involvement. So it means the parents that you need most involved are the hardest to engage. So these are realities that schools are working with. We have to respect that. But we can certainly provide programs that I think are appropriate, that respect parental rights. Um, and if we have these types of programs on the ground, I think it makes it stronger to make a case to the government that parental opt-outs and other things should be available. And, and that's easier to do when you have a program that parents like to say, well, I like this, but I still want to teach this section or this component. So opting out of a whole school system is hard to do. Opting a school out of an entire national policy is hard to do. But if you have a good program, you can more easily put in those exceptions, I think. And so what we've done is we've tried to develop a program that can meet all of these various needs, meet the needs of a government so that we can show how this addresses the policy commitments they've made internationally, regionally, and at home. It may be met in ways they've never thought of before, but we can justify and demonstrate how this does meet them. And then it also meets the needs that schools and families have on the ground, and lots of modification and adaptation can take place there as well. Would you have to know that at the level of the um, United Nations that there is anything that can give support to, for the claim that this is the parents' rights to decide finally as to how their children are to be educated, particularly in matters of very close to human person, sexuality and so on and so forth. Uh, the strongest parental rights language is a human right or something like that. Is in, it's in the Convention on the Rights of the Child. And it's in the Convention on the Rights of the Child. So it's very easy to pull up the paragraphs that defend the rights of parents to, to raise their children, to direct them. So there's language in there that talks about the rights of parents in relation to the evolving capacities of the child. So obviously it's sort of you know, respecting as children develop, parents have to provide that. 
But the Convention on the Rights of the Child applies to all children 18 years and under. And it does clearly enshrine the rights of parents in that. So that is language that's, uh, that's there, it's accepted, it's in all of the most recent iterations. And we, we do a lot of hard work at the UN to make sure that these, these statements and these rights are reiterated in the documents when these, when these types of conversations come up so that we have continual evidence that this is the most recently adopted position of the international institution as well. But the strongest language is always treaty and convention and so the Convention on the Rights of the Child is there and it has that. That said, we also have case studies and court challenges that demonstrate that the fact that it exists in the Convention on the Rights of the Child is not enough because the CRC has been overturned in a variety of cases here and there. But I would suggest that they are not the norm at this point. The right is widely accepted, it's widely adopted. But the key, I think, that we have to think about is how do we engage with this rather than claiming a right as if it's going to do all the work of protecting us. Um, we can see that it's not. So again, when you look at the policy wheel, there's a sort of legal wheel too, that if you're doing something and it's reasonable and it's justifiable and it's meeting these legal requirements, you have a much better chance of, ha of receiving the protection of those legal claims than if you're doing nothing and just sort of grabbing onto these legal claims to justify them. It's, it's the reality of what we've seen now in a lot of these. I mean, those are happening all the time. Uh, yeah, I don't know. I mean, those direct challenges are happening. And, what, and my only point is that we're losing a lot of them. So there's a lot of noise. There's a lot of direct challenges. There's a lot of court cases. Um, and it's certainly not moving the needle. So that's, I think, you know, so you want many flowers to bloom. You know, people can try many different things, but I think that it's worth trying something that engages with the system in a way that still allows us to achieve our goals. And, and the point is that that possibility is still there, but there comes a point where if we, don't, if we don't seize the space that we have, that may be shut off as well, because you have to, you have to make use of the possibilities when they're still there. Um, I, the first thing is that FEM is very young, so we're not the target of any global pharmaceutical campaign or anything at the moment. Um, what we've seen is a very strong and nice reaction from women, but we're definitely at the pilot stage and we're learning as, as we go along. What, the way that we're marketing FEM is really the way that it is in a sense, that FEM is is seeking to provide women with better information about their, their health. And so we want them to understand their health, how their bodies work. We want them to understand their hormones and understand the side effects of, of hormonal insufficiency, whether that's naturally in a sense or artificially caused. This is what we have seen also is very, it's exciting for women. It gives them answers to their bodies. It gives them knowledge they've never had before. So this is how we're working with FEM. Uh, and FEM really has two components. One is the educational component, and this can be taught and provided by anyone, medical or non-medical. 
The other is the medical protocols, and this can only be delivered by a medical professional. So there we're training and working with doctors. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, anything else? Actually, it's something interesting. Are the programs so um, catering for every single country and different uh, approaches, or for it to be integrated smoothly with what they already have? Or, I mean, yeah, like the curriculum and FEM? There has to be a certain level of modification for every country. Yeah, definitely. Yeah, so for the human dignity curriculum, the curriculum is seven hours of content for every grade from kindergarten to grade 12, which is roughly age four to 18. The, and so the content is sort of circular, recurring, and deepening for the age appropriateness of each level. The seven hours for each grade is what we could call pure anthropology. So who is the human person? the powers of living things, the fact that I can I have rational powers to think and choose that allows me to make intentional actions. In this way, I can freely choose and I'm responsible for my actions and I can choose human excellence. That's the core of the program and this is what we're seeing is actually delivering us a lot of the behavior and attitude changes and outcomes that we want to see. We then are developing what we would call a sexual ed module. And this is really teen femme. So we take this physiology, the hormones, the understanding of how the body works, um, and we break this down, and we, we're, be, we're, we're creating these modules for each grade. So it's an extra three hours. It's single sex education, um, and it's optional. So it integrates and it fits into the anthropology, but schools, families, parents, they can begin where they want. They can use it where they want. They can use it or not use it. So again, it's our attempt, for instance, to say, a school could say, yes, we have this sexual education curriculum. It focuses on personal identity and healthy behavior choices. That's the anthropology part. And then the sex ed module can be optional. The parents in one school might decide not to do it or to do it themselves. The parents in another school might. We're trying to make it as flexible as possible to meet all of these needs. And obviously, even in the US, different schools want to start this at different ages. It depends on the school, the, the total situation. Yeah. Um, am I correct that you mentioned main reference to uh, data that is already available about the success of human dignity-based programs? Um, and if so, what, could you elaborate a bit more on that? I know you showed two, two statistics earlier on showing 90% of, uh, I wasn't uh, uh -huh, sure uh -huh. what the detail was, but yeah. The research that I showed is not ours, so it's looking at programs that have similar components and showing the, high, the, the effectiveness possibilities that you can have if you integrate this sort of research data. We're at the very early stages of our research, so we evaluated the program for three years in St. Lucia. We had very good feedback, but realized we needed a more controlled environment, such as the US, where we could manage the data better. We did another evaluation in the fall of 2014, which we have and we can share, um, which again is, it's formative. So it's preliminary, it's in the sense that it's examining the appropriateness of the content, the adaptability of the content, does it you know, meet the needs of the school, the teacher, do the children retain, and do we have this initial behavior and attitude change? So we saw positive outcomes in all of those areas. We saw ways we can continue to improve. This year we'll be focusing on the training of teachers and integrating all of this. And that will set us up for what they would call a summative evaluation, which is where we can then do control groups, start to assess data from the beginning, and that is the beginning of longitudinal studies. So that hard evaluation process will begin next, next fall in the U.S. Mm-hmm, mm-hmm. 
Yeah, I mean, what we can see, it, I, I think some of the more interesting data is that programs that change behavior and attitude focus on providing a clear personal identity for the child. So this is very important for us to know because this is exactly what I would, I would argue the WHO guidelines are really all about. That's a kind of personal identity. And our program is also a kind of personal identity. So families need to assess which kinds of personal identity, which programs do they want to give. We also know that having a clear worldview is important. So children can grow in their capacity of, you know, in the size of their world. So in their, in their young stages, their world is about the size of their family and their classroom. Then it can include their whole school. Then it can include their whole community. And developing a sense of, of the fact that my actions influence all of these broader arenas is very important. Because the broader that effectiveness, you know, the broader that outreach goes, the higher the level of responsibility a child feels for the values and the actions they take. So we want them to understand that sense that everything they do is actually influencing the culture in which they live and move forward. So these are key research data that have not really been applied to sexual education. It argues for the sort of excavation of an anthropology as the starting point. Um, and that argues for this early education. But you, know, you have to decide which worldview and which vision of the human person you want to, to put in there. But the, the interesting thing is that when you get these things in place, you have much higher outcomes for behavior change. Whatever you want that to be, it can be sexual, alcohol, drug, bullying, it's all the same stuff and it lines up on these categories. Okay, well I think that's it. Thank you very much.